thank you all for coming. Welcome to our 14th book talk. Um, this is an occasional series of talks that we hold. And sometimes we have authors who will come and talk about their own work. And other times we have people come to discuss their reading, what they enjoy, different types of books. Um, and in this uh, particular case, we have David Mole here to share with us about reading history, some virtues and vices. Now, I think most of us already know David, but for those who don't, David Mole is our Associate Provost for Teaching and Learning. He's been here at UST for um, quite some time, <laughs> almost 10 years. And he is a self-confessed lifelong addict to the pleasures of and rewards of reading. And I'm also a similar addict to reading, and so I'm really looking forward to hear what he says about history. So please, join me in welcoming David. Well, uh, let me do the right thing first, which is to uh, thank uh, uh, Victoria and the library very much for creating an opportunity uh, for me to um, think a little bit about uh, what it is I like about reading history and, uh, and then show off uh, uh, to the to, to you. What I'm going to do is uh, uh, run on for about mm, 40 minutes at most. So if you're starting to nod off, you can see that <laughs> when it when it when it will be over, and and then we are, then we can talk a little bit more uh, more more generally. When I was doing this, uh, uh, I, I I chose the title, of course, a little in desperation, but uh, I it, but partly because I I, have, I do feel ambiguous about the what I'm trying to do when I read so much history. Of, of, of course it has a higher end uh, to understand more my world, but I, I get so much fun out of it uh, that it doesn't quite seem like uh, that. And, 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 and then I, I came across this quote, uh, uh, this is from Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was uh, an intellectual in the court of Elizabeth I in, in England, so we're what, in 1540, something like that earlier, 1512. Uh, and very famous uh, essayist, and one of his essays is called The Advancement of Learning, uh, something that um, those of us in universities have sometimes come across. He says, knowledge is not to be, is not to be a couch whereon to rest a searching and restless spirit, or a terrace for wandering and viable mind to walk up and down with a fair prospect, or a tower of state for a proud mind to raise itself upon, or a fort or commanding ground for strife and contention, or a shop for profit and sale, but should be a rich storehouse for the glory of the creator and the relief of man's estate. And that struck a chord. I thought, yeah, well, yes, if there's anybody for whom reading is a couch, resting a searching and restless spirit, it's me, uh, or a terrace for wandering up and down with a variable prospect. And so let me organize my reading a little bit around those uh, ideas. Certainly my history reading uh, has a couch-like uh, character. Uh, curiosity, relaxation, even uh, I should say a little voyeurism uh, from time to time. And um, uh, that's perhaps exhibited well by um, this uh, Zhang Dai, some of you will know the name, uh, was born in 1597 when the Ming Dynasty had been in place for 229 years, but at the end of the Ming, until it ended in 1644. And he left a large and tremendously interesting body of writing, in part evoking his world, which is now utterly lost. And uh, Jonathan Spence, uh, one of the great scholars of, uh, in English, of Chinese uh, history uh, uh, wrote about uh, uh, Zhang Dai, and uh, let me read you uh, just a, a, a little bit. As he drifted one evening at leisure on Hangzhou's West Lake at the time of the September fest moon festival, uh, despite the varied delights of the occasion, there was nothing more absorbing to Zhang than watching the other people who were also out on the lake watching the moon. Zhang categorized the moon watchers into five classes. There were the very rich in their formal clothes, entertained by actors as they ate their banquets. Though they were indeed floating under the moon, quote, they never really saw it, though they themselves were worth watching. 
there were those distracted by their efforts at seduction as they sought the attention of the courtesans and pretty boys bunched on the decks of their vessels. Though their bodies were under the moon, they never really looked at it, though they too were worth watching. There were those who reclined on their boats and sipped their wine in the company of women and the Buddhist priests, talking quietly as the music softly played. They did watch the moon, but they wanted others to watch them watching the moon. Then there were the onshore rowdies, who owned no boats but racketed along the lake shore, stuffed with food and pretending to be drunker than they really were. These were the eclectic ones, watching the moon to some extent, and also watching others who were watching the moon. And lastly, there were the studiedly elegant aesthetes who traveled in small boats, their figures sheltered behind fine curtains, sipping tea from delicate white porcelain, with their female companions quietly watching the moon, uh, but in such a way that others could not view them watching it, since they did not watch the moon self-consciously but they too were worth watching. And I, that, I thought that was great. I, I don't know about you, I, I've been to the, the West Lake in Hangzhou, I'm sure many of you have, and, uh, and it is a, you know, I was there nursing a broken heart, as, uh, and uh, it was wonderful. That was 20 years ago, maybe it's not so wonderful now, I don't know, but, uh, and so that, uh, that evokes just a picture, you know, uh, uh, um, unmistakably of a, of a particular place and uh, a tremendous thing. But um, perhaps it still falls under Bacon's strictures, that it's not quite, you know, the advancement of learning. I also wanted to give you something else. Uh, this is um, uh, the, the Corruption of Angels. I bought the book because of the title was so su super. Uh, between March... 1245 okay, and August 1246, we're in Europe now, 5,471 5, men and women from the French Lauragais region between Carcassonne in the southwest and Toulouse in the northeast were questioned in Toulouse about the heresies of the good men, the Bonhomme, and the good women, the Bonne Femna, by the Dominican Inquisitor uh, Cole and uh, Jean de Saint Pierre. Uh, these these were the this was the heresy uh, of of um, uh, the uh, um, the credans. Uh, uh, let me just uh, give you a little introduction. And uh, the inc this inquisition into heretical depravity in the Lauragais. Uh, was without doubt the single largest investigation in the shortest possible time in the entire European Middle Ages. One can, through reading the surviving manuscript of the Lauragais interrogations, in that twist of fate whereby the luck of the historian rests upon the efficiency of persecutors, grasp, however tentatively, something of the vibrant rhythms by which thousands of medieval men and women uh, lived their lives. The uh, I picked out just something uh, from, from, from this. Uh, Emerson Viguier had made up her mind to tell uh, Bernard de Caux and Jean de Saint-Pierre, the inquisitors, the truth about the heresy in the village of Combiac. Combiac is about halfway between Toulouse and uh, Carcassonne. It's an area now which everybody loves to go and all the, the British go and buy little houses to live in after they retire and I'm certainly tempted. In late May or early June 1245, just a few weeks before uh, Amazon's inter interrogation, some men from Combiac took her aside for a quiet word. One of these bullies was her own husband, Guillem Vogier, while the other was the lord of Combiac, Guillem Say. All of the men warned Amazon not to say anything to the inquisitors that could harm the credans, the heretics, such as themselves. Amazon listened to their threats, calmly stated that she no longer liked the Bonhomme, and repeated her intention to confess the truth. Guillem Say, exasperated by her stubbornness, gave up on words and proceeded to stuff her inside a wine barrel. Viguier's youthful son gripped her hand. Boy, screamed the Lord of Combiac as he shoved Amazon into the barrel. Do you want to help this old bag destroy us all? 
Yilem Sei, taking the lad's understandable confusion for defiance, proceeded to squeeze Vigier Jr. into the barrel as well. Emerson and her son stayed inside the wine barrel all night and were freed the next morning only after the mother paid Gilim Say three shillings and seven pence. When Bernard de Cor questioned Amazon on Friday the 23rd June 1245, straight after interrogating her husband, she was, one might say, somewhat careful with the truth, in that she denied having any familiar familiarity with the heretics and their believers. Six months later, however, on Friday the 26th of December 1245, when Bernard de Cor called Viguier back for further questioning, she told him everything she knew about the Bonhomme and their believers in Combiac. So uh, again, uh, a journey uh, is somewhere absolutely uh, unknown and, and peculiar uh, and uh, uh, a real little window onto uh, something uh, 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 something to feed, feed the uh, Im imagination. Um, ba Bacon also warns us against thinking that the advancement of learning is a terrace for a wandering and variable mind to walk up and down with a fair prospect. And uh, under this head of vices, reading, advancement of learning vices, I've got a, a couple of things I, I wanted to uh, uh, bring forward for you. I think uh, it, when I thought when the terrace and the fair prospect, uh, the big vision, uh, I immediately thought of uh, big history, uh, the uh, it, it work, much of it very excellent now, of historians who are interested in the very long period and the very wide uh, realm. Uh, I think this is perhaps the first period when people like myself uh, uh, and, and, and us in the room uh, can, can, can in some ways personally grasp uh, the s scale and scope of the uh, human development and gain some sense of uh, the interconnectedness of uh, the uh, experience of human development over the very long run. Uh, uh, I think a, a particularly readable uh, and um, interesting example of this is John Darwin's uh, book uh, called After uh, Tamerlane. Uh, for me, the main achievement uh, has been helping me to uh, recalibrate for myself the role of Europe in the uh, global historical. I grew up in, in Europe, and, and, and even those of you who grew up in Hong Kong, I think, perhaps uh, strongly influenced by a quite Eurocentric uh, view of uh, uh, of, his, of, of the historical experience, uh, and um, and yet uh, uh, step back, and you can see that uh, the uh, the European um, the Eurasian Revolution that gave Europe uh, the opportunity to expand and dominate uh, to some extent uh, was uh, uh, more um, tentative, more contingent, briefer. Uh, than uh, one might have thought. And, and, and from this distance, now that it's sort of over, uh, a whole new way of thinking about uh, global history uh, emerges. In this book, says Darwin, we traverse a vast historical landscape in pursuit of three themes. Uh, the first is the growth of global connectedness into the intensified form that we call globalization. The second, is the part that was played in this process by the power of Europe and later the West and through the means of empire. The third is the resilience of many of Eurasia's other states and cultures in the face of Europe's expansion. Each of these factors has played a critical part in shaping the world that became the 20th century and a vast semi-unified system of economics and politics, a common arena from which no state, society, economy or culture was able to remain entirely aloof. The, the pivot of the book is, is what he calls uh, the Eurasian Revolution. Uh, the Eurasian Revolution had signaled the onset of a seismic change in the relations of contents, continents and civilizations. It transformed the geopolitics of the early modern world. When the Russians took control of the Crimea, they opened up the Ottoman defenses like an oyster. In South Asia, a British company state based mainly in Bengal 
had become a dominant military power by the 1830s, after a half a century of war. From their port city in Bombay, the British could now drive their influence into the Persian Gulf, across the Indian Ocean, into South Arabia. The European invasion of Asian states, their breakthrough into the North American interior, once the settlers had thrown off British imperial control, their beachheads in the South Pacific, and the spasmodic advances into Western South Africa showed how far they had broken free from the constraints of the early modern world. Yet even in the 1830s, such a European preeminence was not a foregone conclusion. And he comes towards the end uh, in uh, noting the, uh, the resistance of the Eurasian world to European dominance and, and the beginnings of its end. The most vital prop of Europe's primacy in Eurasia and of the powerful position of the great European states in the outer world beyond have been their collective determination not to fight each other. Uh, and what happened to them, of course, was that uh, once the 20th century began, they did begin to fight each other on a huge scale and, uh, and, and drew the world into the, that vortex of, of, of violence. And, uh, and really, uh, I think, in terms of my own life, and uh, we're still picking ourselves up out of that, uh, the consequences of that, still living through the consequences of that. But they certainly include uh, the retreat of Europe and the emergence of uh, uh, China and India and uh, uh, other states in Asia. Very exciting and interesting stuff. And um, um, again on my terrace, I mean, yes, what a terrace. <laughs> uh, the whole world and the, everywhere on it, on your, from your terrace. And, and the other, and here's a real vice, military history, a boy's vice. Um, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I try to avoid the ghastliest bits. I don't read uh, those picture books about weapons platforms that you see in the military history sections of bookstores. I'm tempted, but I never do actually buy them and read them. But uh, the more superior type of military history uh, I, uh, uh, I'm in addicted to. Um, I, I love, I love uh, a military history. I love where, where you get the map of the battle with the lines that tell you what's going to happen. Wellington had chosen his ground well. As he looked southward from his vantage point under the elm tree at the crossroads of the Ohain Road toward the French army on the morning of the battle, Battle of Waterloo, he would have seen two buildings, each of which was to play a key role in the coming events. To his center right, in an advanced position, were the chateau and outbuildings of Hougoumont, well protected with walls, ditches, hedges, and surrounded by a wood, which the Duke had invested with his best troops of all the British foot guards, with orders to hold the place, come what might, that they succeeded in this, despite heavy and repeated attacks by the French infantry, was one of the keys to Wellington's victories in Waterloo. Over to his centre-left was La Haye Sainte, another well-defended farmhouse, with stables, a barn, and a piggery, all enclosed by high walls, which Wellington filled with the King's German Legion, an émigré unit loyal to King George III, which had demonstrated its first-class fighting abilities during the Peninsular War. The possession of these two strongholds with their high brick walls would prove invaluable in disrupting the French line of advance. Hal Rees Gronau, a Welsh Old Etonian ensign who was on duty with the 1st Regiment of Foot Guards at St. James's Palace in London when the Waterloo campaign began, skipped his guard duty there, hoping to see action at Waterloo and to return before anyone noticed he was missing. On the morning of the battle, he recalled, we had not proceeded a quarter of a mile when we heard the trampling of horses' feet and on looking round perceived a large cavalcade of officers coming at full speed. In a moment, we recognized the Duke himself at their head. The entire staff of the army was at close at hand. They all seemed as gay and unconcerned as if they were riding to meet the hounds in some quiet English county. Uh, Roberts goes on, they had good reason to be confident, if not quite gay and unconcerned, because the topography across which Wellington had chosen to receive Napoleon's attacks could hardly have been better. Uh, I, I, it's a, a nice little book, uh, and I see that the library owns a copy, and I certainly recommend it. It'll only take you a couple of hours uh, of really uh, 
I, I particularly for the boys in the audience. Bacon, uh, to, to go back to the text, uh, is not to be, not our pursuit of learning is not to be a tower of state for a proud mind to raise itself upon. My, my own feeling is that history is really an antidote to that, to the proud mind. It really is a teacher of, uh, of, of humility. Uh, I think it makes it very hard to hold on to simple beliefs about politics and people, and uh, certainly the simple beliefs that I had when I was younger. Uh, I think uh, certainly history has to some extent cultivated them and, and, and you know, uh, helped me to en enrich them. But, to, it, but it's also uh, uh, undermined uh, uh, those, l l reduced my confidence uh, in, in, in those. Uh, I, I, well, for me, perhaps one of the uh, a big one of the examples of this is um, my understanding of uh, the colonial experience. That uh, the uh, I, I think what what although I uh, grew up on the political left uh, in Britain and was uh, have always been sort of you know anti empire and all of that, I, I, very hard not to have uh, uh, lived uh, 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 absorbed. Uh, uh, an understanding of the British uh, colonial uh, experience and empire and regarded it in some secret way as somewhat positive, you know, railways and good government and, uh, and at any rate, although it may have been, uh, you know, profoundly uh, uh, wrong uh, that uh, those who were engaged in it uh, had a certain goodwill None of this is true at all. It's disastrously false. Uh, and um, I recently picked up, uh, this is only one example, really, uh, of uh, uh, Yasmin Khan's uh, short book on the great the partition of India into India and, and, and Pakistan, and uh, uh, gave me a sense, uh, again, of uh, uh, the tragic uh, outcome of uh, the British uh, exercise uh, in India. Uh, here you have, uh, you, certainly the British were not, um, were not, the, were not responsible for the, uh, sh you know, the shocking political divisions of nationalists within Indian, Indian society. No, I mean the uh, Jenner and the, the League and uh, Nero and the, uh, uh, the Congress were unable to come to a formulation that would enable the country to hold together. But the British, in their scramble to leave on time uh, and to just get out of there in 1947, 1946, 1947, tr tremendously uh, uh, complicated uh, that uh, difficulty uh, and, uh, and, and demonstrated uh, again, I think, uh, Nobody in India knew where the borders would lie on Independence Day itself. <coughs> Rumors, hints, and suggestions flew around. Staff at the Viceroy's house leaked information. Newspapers published provisional maps with erroneous indications of where the boundary was likely to be drawn. Administrators complained about the manner in which the boundary was being scrapped. Preserving good Indian-British relations, especially during the lavish ceremonial display on the 15th of August, was the excuse for holding back the, the award. The Radcliffe Line, that was the line drawn by the chief of the commissioners who was employed by the British to draw a line through the Punjab and through Bengal. The Radcliffe Line was finally revealed to the public on the 17th of August, exactly the same day that the first regiment of British troops departed from Bombay. For many outside the grip of middle-class nationalist mentalities, the line was irrelevant to their daily hardships. Uh, for those uh, who were caught up in the nationalist campaigns, though, the line meant everything. Radcliffe was aware of the contentious and unsatisfactory nature of the award and admitted as much. The line zigzagged precariously across agricultural land, cut off communication from their sacred pilgrimage sites paid no heed to railway lines or the integrity of forests, divorced industrial plants from the agricultural hinterlands where raw materials such as jute were growing. 
the inevitable result, particularly in the most contested districts of Punjab, Lahore, Amritsar, Gurdaspur, Hoshiapur, Jalandhar, and in parts of Bengal, was dire confusion. The violence was designed to eliminate and drive out. I'm sorry. From August the 15th, the violence would be utilized to achieve new ends, to drive out the other and stake a claim on the land, while killers attempted to mark out the limits of the new country's rightful borders with dead bodies, invisible spots on display. The dead, as Charles Mayaram has graphically expressed it in a powerful study of the partition violence, became signals to the living of the construction of ethnic boundaries. For all the effort which had been invested in untangling the two nations, their land, possessions, and military stores, few had turned their minds to the new nation's most precious asset, their people. So a huge tragedy, an enormous tragedy, and my country had a huge hand in it. And not only that, but there's a, a, a couple of books that I recommend to you, again, military history, but have a good... Uh, forgotten armies and forgotten wars about the wars in Burma and the uh, the British ran away they ran away when the Japanese invaded they ran away and they stole uh, the native people's cars to run away in. and uh, they left the people who had helped them uh, in their rule behind without a thought uh, this was uh, not a hundred years ago. Uh, this was my father's generation and my father's father's uh, generation. And so uh, I think uh, uh, history teaches humility. But it also it teaches humility, I think, in a, 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 a slightly other way. And I come to the other point about the fort or commanding ground for a, a strife and contention. It teaches in another kind of humility to make it strike a lighter note, uh, that uh, you learn that you are historical yourself and that you are not outside this at all. Uh, this is a, a, a book by uh, Peter Hennessy called uh, Having It So Good, and it's about Britain in the 1950s. And this is a picture of the boys and girls at Queen Elizabeth II's coronation party. And I was there. I was there, I was five years old, and uh, this little boy at the back could have been me. <laughs> and I, so I, now I'm in a history book now. And um, my mother, it was a fancy dress, and my, I, this is my earliest memory, I think. My mother, there was what they, a, a carpet in front of the fire, which was designed when the sparks came from the fire to stop them, you know. And my, she cut it up and made me chaps, and I went as a cowboy. <laughs> and, and I read that even the fire is now history. Uh, the design of domestic grates did not change substantially until concern about the evils of smoke became widespread in the 1950s. In 1948, 98% of living rooms still had an open fire. I, I remember my father, in the morning, his duty when he got up was to rake out the uh, the fire, the coal fire, and take the ashes outside and relay the the fire for, for, for my mother. A good husband, I guess he was. Uh, or a fire combined with a back boiler or a stove. And we heated our water that way uh, when I was uh, when I was a child. Coal-fired cooking stoves were still being installed in many new houses between the wars, and a quarter of homes were still cooking by coal in the 1950s, and as, 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 as we were. So not only is that a personal experience, but it's now a historical fact. And uh, I'm in the book. And I'm in the book in another place. One of my other, my earliest uh, political experience uh, was when my parents took me on the, what were called the Aldermaston Easter Marches. This was the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Britain, we're now in a period uh, when the uh, nuclear uh, states are, are emerging and the British had to decide whether they would continue to be a nuclear power. Uh, and uh, a, a huge and popular movement arose uh, uh, in the uh, early 50s, the mid 50s, I guess, uh, to oppose Britain's nuclear pretensions, the campaign for nuclear disarmament. 
and my, 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 my dad and my mum took me and my brother on one of these marches from London to the uh, Oldham Austin Research uh, Centre. And, and, and here I am again. The fledgling CND, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, might not have had a, have had a leading showman, but it had something even better than perhaps the single most memorable piece of post-war iconography which has endured as a global symbol instantly recognizable and easily understood. Its logo, which was ready to be paraded before the press, newsreel and television cameras on Good Friday 1958. You know the, the circle with the, 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 the line and the, yeah? yeah? I have that. I have one. <laughs> I still have it. So uh, again, I think we, you know, we learn uh, 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 how a little bit how to think of ourselves uh, as you reach a certain age, and you, 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 your, your own, your own world starts to become uh, historical. I, that's been one of the most fun things uh, to have discovered uh, 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 late as a as a reader. Let me go on to the Bacon's positive. Knowledge should be a rich storehouse for the glory of the creator and the relief of man's estate. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, from Bacon's point of view, the glory of the creator, but uh, that triggers in my mind uh, some recommendations. Uh, this, this is a book by Dermot McCulloch, uh, Oxford historian and a very fine writer, who also wrote a very good history of Christianity. I'm not, I'm not personally uh, a Christian except in the most um, relaxed sense of that, uh, that, that, that word. Uh, but I'm certainly very interested in uh, religious history uh, uh, because uh, uh, you learn a lot. And certainly he writes, uh, in his history of Christianity, he is asking himself a very uh, interesting question. In the, in, in the development of Christianity, do we see uh, God uh, developing himself, if I may be, is, is God realizing himself in, the, in our world? Uh, it, it does, does, the, does the history of Christianity, its vicissitudes, its success, uh, all its difficulties, nevertheless display that? And that, that's certainly an interesting thought. Yeah. But this is, this is more fun. Uh, this is where we're, we're in uh, Germany uh, uh, at the beginning of the Reformation, at the very end of the 1500s. The liturgy of which the Mass was the centerpiece was not only good for the soul, it was fun. German Christians, for instance, looked forward on Easter morning to a good time celebrating Christ's harrowing of hell, his cosmic hooliganism, when he triumphantly descended to the devil's kingdom after dying on the cross. At Hof in Upper Franconia, a solemn procession with crucifix customarily tried to make its way out of the church, only to find its path barred by a crowd of local youths dressed as devils. After a series of ritual challenges and the vigorous mock fight with plenty of noise and slamming of doors, the devils fled the scene, throwing down their flaming torches representing hellfire in front of the victorious cross bearers. At the Holy Spirit's festival, of Whitsuntide in the Bavarian diocese of Eichstadt, a carved wooden dove of the spirit was lowered down on the congregation through a hole in the church roof. This hole was common, a common extra architectural amenity in large German churches. The dove was closely followed by buckets full of water, and the member of the congregation most thoroughly soaked <coughs> became the, the, the town's Finkstovel, or Whitsunbird, for the coming year. Clergy might grumble about some of this excess and try to stop it, but in fact it was proof of a huge stability in the old religion. The apparent irrelevance, irreverence was itself a symptom of how strongly the vast majority of people felt faith in the system and how much they could relax within it. A problem would only arise if the faithful began listening to a question. Was the mass, the linchpin of it all, in fact what it claimed to be? This question could be asked because the Western Church in its characteristic tidy-minded fashion, tried to find a comprehensible explanation of a miracle. How in the mass, the bread, lying on the pattern, and the wine in the chalice, 
turned into the body and blood of Christ, making him as corporally, bodily present as he had been in Palestine. And so between 1500 and 1700, uh, I couldn't say that the, the terrific civil war in Europe was fought over that question, but certainly that that question was involved in that fight, how to understand that miracle of the, of the Mass. And Luther's uh, fundamental objections to Catholicism were around the question of the Mass. And it divided Europe and has divided Europe uh, 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 to this day. The difference between Catholic and Protestant Europe would be instantly obvious to any traveler bundled up, blindfolded, set down at random in a street on a Sunday morning and told to listen to the church bells. During the Reformation, Protestants had culled countless unwanted bells to be melted down for armaments and for sale, adroitly combining profit with iconoclastic destruction of Pope's superstition. Nevertheless, Protestants had not dispensed with bells altogether. But after the Reformation, the sound on a Catholic and a Protestant street would be very different. A Sunday morning in Catholic Europe would be full of the competing clangor of a bewildering variety of encounters with God. Just as before Martin Luther's agonized rebellion, the parish churches, the cathedral, the collegiate chapter, the monasteries, the nunneries, the hospital, would all still be sending out their cacophony of noise, not only to summon people to celebrations of the Mass, but also repeatedly to tell the faithful out in the streets or in the fields that God had been seen once more in bread and wine in the priest's acts of consecration. In Protestant Europe, the parish church eliminated all its competitors. The monasteries were ruined, demolished, turned to useful purposes such as warehouses, workhouses, schools, libraries. The cathedral buildings demoted if they were kept at all into large parish churches. So a single bell might austerely be summoning the parish to hear the word of God. Uh, very beautifully done uh, uh, work and uh, well, 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 well worth the read and contemplation. Let me, I'm coming to the end, I, uh, uh, I really am, and uh, so let me finish perhaps on a, um, a slightly more uh, serious note. I think for any reader of history, it, uh, and, I, and, and this, I hope this doesn't seem too Eurocentric. I, I think it, it, it goes, goes beyond that. But to any reader of history, I think that the great narrative, you know, the, the all-encompassing all historical narrative, uh, is the story of the Third Reich and the, the, the rise of the, the Nazis in Germany in the 1920s, uh, the, uh, their ruthlessness and violence, this, this, the, you know the squalor of, of, of their politics, uh, their ability to to, to draw uh, the, the mass of German many in, into their movement, the emergence of that bizarre hero, you know Hitler, and 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 the the launch, uh, you know that of that war, uh, uh, that inability to uh, uh, to stop. Uh, dragging the, 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 the whole of, of, of Europe and then the world into that and, and the catastrophic collapse and destruction of Germany uh, by, by, the, by, by bombing and, and invasion by armies from both sides. This, this is, uh, for, for anybody, you know, uh, looking back, uh, this is this is the great story to reflect on, I think, and 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 has much to tell us, I think, about our our human capacity uh, for foolishness and 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 evil. Uh, we are really fortunate in uh, ha having a historian who a contemporary of ours who's risen to the challenge. There are many many books on the Third Reich, you know. but uh, I certainly you know the three volume uh, by Richard Evans. Uh, the, uh, is, 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 is worth your time if you're a serious, uh, serious reader, uh, well worth your time. The biggest lesson that I learned from reading it, I think, was the way in which a society can descend into violence uh, and that the, uh, the, the normal uh, political life uh, that can be engaged in in, a, in in resolving problems is set aside uh, and replaced uh, uh, by violence, uh, first on the street, uh, uh, 
violence was uh, like a drug uh, for such men. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the people who were drawn into the Nazi uh, movement. Uh, often they had only a haziest notion of what they were fighting for. One young Nazi reported that witnessing opponents trying to break up a Nazi meeting made me instinctively a National Socialist, even before he became acquainted with the party's goals. Another joining the Nazi movement in 1923 lived a life of almost incessantly violent activism, suffering beatings, stabbings and arrests for the best part of a decade, as he recounted in detail in his autobiographical essays. Particularly graphic account, though by no means untypical, of stormtrooper activities was provided by a school teacher uh, in the, he joined the party in 1920s and called up one evening when his brown shirt group to defend a Nazi rally held in a nearby town against the Reds, the, the Social Democrats and the Marxists. We all gathered at the entrance of the town and put on white armbands and then you could hear the thundering marching of our column Without weapons, without sticks, but with clenched fists, we marched in strict order and iron discipline into the catcalls and screaming of the crowd before the meeting hall. They had sticks and fence boards in their hands. It was 10 o'clock. <coughs> with a few maneuvers in the middle of the street, we pushed the crowd against the walls to clear. Just at that moment, a carpenter drove through with a small truck and a black coffin in it. As he went by, one of us said, Well, let's see who we can put in there. The screams, cries, whistles and howls grew even more intense. Two rows of our columns stood still, charged with energy. A signal, and we go marching into the hall where a few hundred rioters are trying to shut up our speaker. We came in just in time, marching in step along the walls until we had closed the ring around them, leaving an opening only at the entrance. A whistle sounds, we tightened the ring. Ten minutes later, we had put them out into the fresh air. The meeting goes on while outside all hell breaks loose. So um, from that kind of experience on the street and grow this movement to, uh, uh, that is uh, completely concerned with war, uh, is intending to wage war, uh, does wage war, is these are, these are steps that can be taken by human societies and it's, uh, it's very well uh, to remember that. Uh, uh, even when we feel intensely about a political struggle and strongly about what needs to be done to, uh, to, sort, uh, uh, to sort things out. Let me just finish off, though, by perhaps arguing that uh, Bacon's judgments are a bit harsh. Uh, I think, you know, for a rounded uh, advancement of learning, certainly curiosity and uh, fun uh, have a role. And uh, certainly um, a, a delight uh, uh, in the range uh, of scholarship and uh, the things that you can find out there and read uh, uh, certainly has its role. Uh, and, and although uh, we uh, want to be serious and we want to ease man's estate, uh, we certainly do, uh, that there is a great role for, uh, for reading uh, history uh, as, as, as a way of uh, educating ourselves and uh, um, uh, staying on the couch and uh, for a restless mind. Okay, so thanks. Well, thank you very much, David. That was really fun and interesting, and I too am much more of a couch and terrace reader <laughs> than of the other sort. Um, we have some time for Q&A or um, remarks, so would anybody like to say anything? Okay. I'm just wondering, uh, uh, David, you know, with all your readings and all this interesting story in different setting, different time, different cultures, what kind of lesson do you think that we can learn, you know, in the in the development of the human society? Okay, I mean, your part you starting from not far away. I mean, only yeah. about eight century or nine yeah. centuries ago. Okay, but human history must be longer than longer that. But and I'm sure you you read things far, uh, go back to you maybe young Greece and so on. Okay, uh, so I I think. Uh, you, you know, it's, there's something unique in the earth, and you know, why there's, there's a life there, and then scientists argue about it, okay? And of course, I mean, some people think they're also ET, okay? Uh, but it, it can, really came a long way for, for the human being to, to kind of, uh, you know, 
come together and, and set up different types of society, different kinds of civilization, and they interact, you know, sometimes in a violent way and something like that. So, so, so in reading those, so can, can you, do you have a certain conclusion about any simple guideline that you can point and say this is one, two, three, four, and, and say that this, this may be the lesson that we're learning? Can you say something about that? Well, of course not, no. <laughs> um, I used to. You know, but you know your Bible, uh, uh, he who begins with certainty shall end in doubt, mm -hmm. and he who begins in doubt shall end in certainties. Well, I, I, I began with certainties, uh, and I've, have, I've ended in doubt. I mean, I suppose that the biggest, the, 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 the single experience really is the paradox of the uh, tremendous um, uh, capacity of human beings. I mean, what an what a amazing machine it is and, uh, and the societies if you well <laughs> in part you know and uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, puts to shame anything that we've made uh, and our capacity as social beings as well uh, on one side and the awful mess we've managed to make you know of our life together on the other and the misery uh, that, that, that you know that 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 paradox uh, we have to we have to live with that don't we Okay. Yeah, just, I mean, one of the things that has always impressed me about history, but especially the, the recent history in the sense where, you know, we were alive, we were there um, at the time, so from our childhood onward, is how striking it is that values and assumptions that seem perfectly natural to the largest to, to, the, to the the large body of people to the majority and seem again natural and logical and the way of the way the world is and yet a few decades later or a few centuries later look absurd and and the shocking and it's it's and one of the things that that I, I, I mentioned to the students when I'm teaching is, we have no idea today, you have no idea what your, what values you hold today as logical and natural will to your children be offensive. And, uh, and, and the more you read of history, the more sort of that, at the same time there's a threat of humanity, but, yeah, yeah. but somehow um, this whole idea of, of what we collectively agree is is right, and then later it looks so wrong. I guess, again, a paradox, though, I think you're quite correct about that. I mean, the idea of fighting a 300-year civil war about whether Christ actually does uh, corporeally appear at the Mass in the... But uh, uh, what's that about? Uh, but on the other hand, when you read the account of the West Lake, all those people are recognizable, right? We know all those people, right? Uh, that doing that kind of thing and also we recognize uh, uh, Zhang uh, as well as, as uh, you know that you know rather haughty observer who you know uh, sees it all and yeah, so we, we haven't changed that much and yet uh, two paradoxes I guess we have a matrix now yes. okay um, I have a question and, and then maybe um, and that is um, I like to read history too, but I'm not very systematic about it. And I was wondering, are you systematic, or how do you skip from topic yeah, to topic? So sometimes I, I do. I have, I have pick up themes. Uh, 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 the Vietnam War, for example. I, you know, when I was a young man, uh, 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 getting the U.S. out of Indochina was a big thing, and uh, so I wanted to know more about that. And so I, you know, I will find what I can. But I am, I am an awful magpie with it as well, as you can tell. I mean, yeah. I, I'm most, I'm. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Terrorist attack. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I get drawn to, I get drawn to pretty books. <laughs> you know, handsomely produced books. If I find a, of about the right length. <laughs> okay, are there questions and comments? Um, we have a lot to learn from history, of course, reading history. 
but I from you know, I am a librarian. Always wonder how or what we can do. Do you have any idea what we can do to give our students a spark to get them interested to read more? Yeah. I've always read. You know, the the first book I remember was uh, the Illustrated History of Britain, and I, I, I it had those pictures of uh, uh, the Black Prince in his armor. You know, and uh, tables of all the kings and queens. Uh, um, I, 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 it, it, it's a habit that needs to start early, I think, uh, ideally. Well, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I suppose, well, this, the, this, the, the thing is to, to, to see, to understand what a pleasure it is. You know, it's nothing to do with credits or, you know, awards. What a, just what a simple pleasure it is. You know. And what, what can I can imagine my life? If I if I didn't have a book to read at bedtime. <laughs> okay, we do have a couple of people who look like they might be students here. Do we have any um, comments that they'd like to make about why they like history or don't like history? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anything more? Yes, I do. Uh, I, 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 I like I like biography. Um, uh, it's good biography is quite hard to find, actually. Uh, How do you define good biography? <laughs> well, I, 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 I I like I I suppose I like a biography which sets the person in a historical context and. And I understand a little bit about how they, how they, how they, how they worked, and uh, 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 and some. Uh, I, I guess that is another thing. I think the biography tends to a, a, a attract uh, popular historians a bit, uh, who don't always do a, 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 a good job of it. But I, 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 I do read, I do read biography if I can find it. Right. So that may not be a total. So, so right. when you read it, can you judge? Right. Right. You want? Perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. I. I well, I. The but uh, the, the Roberts uh, uh, wrote a very good biography of Lord Salisbury, which uh, really evoked that late Victorian. British uh, political life. Lord, Lord Salisbury, uh, when he finished the Parliament at night, uh, he t his carriage took him to King's Cross Station, where a train was waiting, his own private train, uh, to take him up into uh, uh, to, to, to where he, he lived. Okay. Well, on thank that note. On that <laughs> note, imagining how lovely it would be to have our own private train. Um, we're passing around some feedback sheets, so um, please feed, um, fill that out so we can um, know what you think. And as, um, as David already mentioned, um, some of the books that he was discussing are already in the collection. Others have just arrived and will um, be available very soon. And so I will also alter the um, web page to include some of the ones that were not listed originally. Uh, that was just to give you a bit of a taste. Um, we also would like to thank David and um, by giving him a souvenir. So our library director, Ms. Diana Chan, will present a gift to David. <laughs>